and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. During the medieval era, the Islamic world was dominated by Arab culture. The old heartland of the Middle East was still nominally the land of the Abbasid Caliphate, and nominally, at least, that was the leader to whom most other Muslims, at least uh, Sunni Muslims, would pledge allegiance. But as we talked about last week, the Mongol invasions dealt a death blow to that old empire. And as the world moved into the Renaissance era, the Islamic world in particular would come to be dominated by a new power, the Ottoman Empire. Now, the story of the Ottoman Empire begins right after the major Mongol invasions and about a generation and a half before the plague. It starts in a place called the Sultanate of Rum. Rum is the Turkish word for Rome. And this Sultanate of Rum, Sultanate of Rome, if you will, consists of most of Anatolia. Now, this is land that the Turks had taken from the Byzantines in the past. And at this time, the Byzantines still referred to themselves as the Romans. So naturally enough, when they took this land and started to settle down, these particular Seljuk Turks called themselves the Sultanate of Rum. Now, when the Mongols attacked and devastated the entire Middle East, these Seljuk Turks in the Sultanate of Rum do things a little bit differently. Uh, rather than fight the invincible Mongol horde, they submit, and they become a Mongol vassal. As a result, at the same time in history where Arab culture in the Middle East is just absolutely been rocked, these folks up in Anatolia are actually doing okay. At least they're doing better than anybody who has had to deal with a Mongol invasion. Now, at the same time, the Sultanate is internally divided. By the late 1200s, it's divided into several bailiks. These are military governorships. And each bailiq is ruled by a bey, that is, a military governor. One of these governors in particular is named Osman I, and his bailiq is on the Byzantine frontier. The Byzantines at this time still control a lot of western Anatolia, especially along the Black Sea coast and along the Sea of Marmara, which is right by Constantinople, and along that area is where Osman's particular bailiq is located. On one of his earlier episodes of Hardcore History, the popular podcaster Dan Carlin compares monarchy to a roll of the dice. Each time you roll the dice... You could get an Aurelian or a Victoria, or you could get a Nero or a John of England. You don't really know. What is fascinating, at least to me, about the Ottomans in particular is that for the first half of their history, they seem to roll all sevens. It's just one fantastic, brilliant ruler after another. And then for the second half of their history, they seem to roll all snake eyes, and it's one incompetent, weak ruler after another, but sometimes that's just how the monarchy dice roll. Now, Osman I, who had found the Ottoman dynasty as one of these top-tier rulers, and He's also like many founding figures in that a lot of his life is legendary. 
The Turks of this time are still semi-nomadic, and even a military governor might be barely literate. And the circumstances of his birth might never be written about, just to take one example of things we know very little about. What we do know about Osmond comes from Byzantine records of battles at the time and also from later Turkish legends about his time. It's tough to get an accurate picture of the man himself. Like I said, we don't even know when he was born. He's born sometime in the mid-1250s. Some legends say that he was born on February 13th 1258, the very day the Mongols entered Baghdad to destroy it. Now, to me, that's a little bit too on the nose, but you never know. Similar later propaganda that he was an Arab is equally unlikely. He's almost certainly a Turk of a family that is already known and influential in the area. Uh, what we do know for sure is that he becomes Bey in the year 1280, sometime in his mid-twenties. And here is where we hear the first culturally significant legend about Osman I. And in this legend... Osman is staying with a sheik that is an Islamic holy man who also has some political power, and this holy man is named Edibali. And while Osman is living with Edibali in his mansion and studying from him, he falls in love with Edibali's daughter, a young woman named Malhatun, and he asks for her hand in marriage, but Edibali won't give his permission. Osman is a member of nobility, and Malhatun is, at the end of the day, just a preacher's daughter, so to speak. But then Osman has a dream. And this dream is reminiscent of the Book of Revelations. It's kind of an acid trip, if you will, filled with all kinds of symbolism, but the crux of it is that the moon, which symbolizes Malhatun, sets in Osman's heart. And from this junction, a tree grows, and that tree grows to encompass all of Anatolia and the Middle East and North Africa and Eastern Europe. And all throughout this land, Osman sees minarets, and all the leaves of this tree are pointing to the center, to Constantinople, which glows like a jewel at the heart of the whole thing. When he wakes up, Osman tells Edibali about his dream, and Edibali gives his consent for the marriage. He says that clearly this means that Malhatun and Osman's offspring would rule a great empire. And indeed, Osman's descendants would rule over almost all of the land symbolized in the dream. And his dynasty would last until 1922, less than a hundred years ago. So much for the legend of Osman's dream... How exactly he comes to power is also unclear. He may have inherited his position, or he may have to fight his brothers for it. He may even live as an outlaw for a time. The one thing that's consistent across all the different versions of the Osman story is that he loves fighting Byzantines. Now, as we already discussed, right, he has some opportunity to do this because his Beylik is located right along that Byzantine frontier. And as a semi-independent Bey, again, he has some autonomy, 
he is free to make war on neighboring Christians, and make war he does. Osman's army and economy are then bolstered by refugees from elsewhere in Anatolia. There are a couple of reasons for this. One is the fact that he is making war on the Christians. This draws some people who are warriors, who are looking for plunder, or who want to go to war for religious reasons. Those types of people aren't going to see a lot of action with most of the other bays in the Sultanate of Rum because all of those people's neighbors are also Muslims. So where do you go? You go to Osman's Bay. And another reason that he is seeing an influx of refugees is that the situation with the Mongols is a little bit tense. The Mongols keep interfering in the Sultanate's internal politics, and people are nervous about a potential invasion, and Osman's territory is the furthest part of the Sultanate from any Mongols. So a lot of people who are not looking for war, who are actually trying to avoid trouble, well, they bolster his population too. Now, in 1302, that is 22 years into Osman's reign, the Sultanate of Rome falls apart altogether. This is a long and involved story of internal politics, but basically, after one coup too many and a lot of Mongol interference, nobody wants to be Sultan anymore and the office becomes vacant. And so what was at least a loosely centrally ruled state now becomes a bunch of independent bailiks. But this leaves Osman as the strongest. Right? He has spent the last 22 years raiding the Byzantines, taking a little territory along the coast, and attracting a whole lot of new citizens. And the Byzantine emperor Andronikos II Paleologos sees this danger. Before, Osman could raid, but he couldn't do a whole lot of conquering. Now that he's independent, he can. So what does the emperor do? Well, he tries to ally with the Mongols. This makes sense if you look at a map. He's on the west side of Osman, the Mongols are to the east, and after all, the Mongols might have some interest in recovering a lost vassal, but the Mongols are also busy fighting the Egyptian Mamluks at this time, and they lose a battle in the Middle East, and they have to regroup. Okay, Emperor Andronicus cannot rely on them, at least for the time being. So the next thing he does is he hires some Catalonian mercenaries to fight the Ottomans. Right? These people come all the way from Western Europe for a lot of money, and at first they have some success uh, in Anatolia, pushing the Ottomans back a little bit. I keep saying the Ottomans, it's really Osman's Beylik still right now, but we'll call them the Ottomans for simplicity, because we all know what we're talking about. And again, these mercenaries have some success, but as they're going about reclaiming this little strip of land in the name of the emperor they end up angering some Byzantine villagers, some local Greeks who then massacre a local garrison of mercenaries. At this point, the mercenaries switch sides. They turn on the empire, and Andronicus has to use his depleted army fighting his own mercenaries instead of the Turks. 
Right? He hired mercenaries because he didn't want to put his army at risk. Now, not only is his army at risk, but it's not even being used against the Turks. It's being used against these mercenaries. And he does successfully put down this Catalonian mercenary company, but it sets him back. And it gives Osmond a big opening to take more land. Now, Byzantine weakness is not the only thing Osmond has going for him. We talked about how there were a lot of other Muslims moving into his territory, but there are also a number of Anatolian Christians who are weary of the Byzantine Empire's harsh justice system and high taxes. And by comparison, Ottoman rules are relatively easygoing. Right? Pay your jizya, pay your taxes, and Osman is going to leave you alone. So... His population is just exploding, and when he goes in to take one Byzantine settlement after another, there is oftentimes not even a whole lot of resistance. And meanwhile, Emperor Andronicus, is, he has trouble finding a target to strike back against. The Turks at this time are still semi-nomadic. Osman has a capital city, a city called Sogut, that is a heavily fortified mountain town. It's basically a fortress, and in its location, virtually impossible to assault. Now, he controls some vulnerable trade cities, but he doesn't even really rely on them. None of them are the seat of his power. If... Andronicus comes and takes one, well, that's really no skin off Osman's nose. He'll just pull back and come take it back later. Well, in 1302, with all of this going on in the background, when the Sultanate of Rum collapses, like I said, Osman takes advantage. He sends messages to all his Byzantine Christian neighbors convert and join him, submit and pay the jizya, right, the special tax for non-Muslims, or be faced with war. Many convert and many more pay the tax. And those who choose to fight are doomed to fail. Between 1302 and his death in 1323 or 1324, Osman conquers a ton of Byzantine territory. To the west, he conquers as far as the Sea of Marmara, that is the small sea between the Mediterranean and Black Seas. Well, he controls that whole coast, at least on the Asian side, and he has taken all of Byzantium's territory along the Black Sea in the north. It's a lot of land, and it brings in a lot of trade and a lot of wealth, which attracts even more people from the rest of Anatolia. It's easy to see how this could start to snowball, isn't it? Osman would be succeeded by his son, Orhan. And much like his father, we don't know much about Orhan's early life. He starts to come into historical focus, so to speak, when he takes over rule of the Beylik. Uh, we know that rather than fight with his younger brother, al Adin for the throne, he would appoint his brother as the vizier. And the two would rule together, um, the vizier being the chief advisor or prime minister, if you will, to the sultan. Between 1323 and 1331, Orhan and al-Adin conduct a series of campaigns to capture all remaining Byzantine territory in Anatolia. 
There is not much left, but the Byzantines still had a little bit of land along the Mediterranean, and now, by 1331, they don't. And just as we can watch the early Ottoman Empire sort of snowball, we can also watch how losing some land for the Byzantines causes them to lose other land. In this case, well, with the Byzantines so clearly weakened, the Serbs in the north, who have been part of the Byzantine Empire, well, they launch their own national revolt. And that keeps the Byzantines busy in their Balkan territories, right? It keeps them out of Anatolia. It keeps them from trying to retake this land that Orhan and al Aidin have taken. And it gives Orhan and al Aidin the opportunity to construct an administrative state. Like I said, the Mongols are still very much a semi-nomadic people, but they start intentionally taking on many of the trappings of a settled society. For example, up until this point, the Ottomans have not had their own currency. As many nomadic peoples do, they simply use the currencies and the coinage from the settled peoples around them. Well, Orhan starts minting coins and he establishes a university. These are not people who are nomads coming in to destroy civilization. They are trying to build their own civilization. And at the same time, al Aidin establishes a standing army. This will prove to be important... Uh, during Ottoman history, mostly because they rely so much on their army early on. This is a young, conquering empire. And this army has soldiers who are salaried and provisioned by the state. They are true professionals. This predates the first established European national army by a century. The Ottomans are serious about building their own state. And this goes on for about ten years, this period of relative peace and building of national infrastructure. But in 1341, a civil war breaks out in the Byzantine Empire. Now, the details are Byzantine, but the long and short of it is that Emperor Andronicus III Paleologos dies in his 40s, probably from malaria. And the empire is then split in two. The first faction is a regency council for Andronicus' nine-year-old son, John V Paleologos. On the other side, you have... His chief advisor, Andronicus' chief advisor, who would come to be known as John the Sixth, Cantacosinos. I am sure I am butchering some of these dynasty names. I do apologize. Anyway, the civil war rages for five years, from 1341 until 1346 with the Ottomans sitting on the sidelines. But in 1346, a increasingly desperate John VI proposes an alliance to Orhan. Orhan ends up accepting the alliance, and he even marries the emperor's daughter, Theodora, despite their differences in religion. Orhan is settling down, he's minting coins, and he is participating in European dynastic politics. And in large part thanks to this 
alliance with Orhan, John VI is able to secure a peace. The very next year, in 1347, his rival, John V, voluntarily agrees to a co-emperorship. The two of them are going to rule together. And John VI is going to act as senior emperor for the first ten years. And to seal the deal, John V marries John VI's younger daughter, Helena. Unfortunately... That same year marked the outbreak of the Black Death in the Mediterranean region. And this would hit densely packed, trade reliant Constantinople, the heart of the empire, much harder than Constantinople's Turkish and Balkan neighbors, who were a little bit more rural, shall we say, and a little bit less prone to the spread of disease. And during this chaos, John V would once again try and take sole leadership of the empire. He would attack John VI's brother, Matthew, uh, who was a major governor in the Byzantine Empire. He would attack him on flimsy pretenses, and John VI would formally ask Orhan for assistance. And the Ottoman Bey would send a Turkish force across the Dardanelles. In October of 1352, that Turkish expeditionary force would defeat a Serbian force fighting on behalf of John V. Now, John V would ultimately win that civil war in 1354. He would send John VI to a monastery to live out his days, but during the chaos of the Civil War, Orhan's armies decide to take some land for themselves. They seize the Gallipoli Peninsula. That is a peninsula in Europe which sort of hangs down and runs parallel to the Dardanelles. That is a narrow strait separating Europe and Asia, right, the Anatolian part of Asia, and it is very easy to get across that strait on a few boats. And so the Ottomans are able to now control that Gallipoli Peninsula. They have a foothold in Europe. And despite the seizure of this land and the fact that they were on opposite sides in the Civil War, Relations between Orhan and Byzantine Emperor John V would be surprisingly warm. Partially, it seems, because both men valued family ties and the two were still brothers-in-law. At one point, for example, Genoese pirates would kidnap the son of Orhan and Theodora, a young man named Khalil, and... John V would pay the ransom on their behalf and secure Khalil's release and make sure that he gets successfully home to his dad. Orhan would die in the year 1362 after a reign of roughly 40 years at the age of 80. He would die of natural causes, and his son, Murad I, would take over as Bey. Now, Murad is yet another example of an excellent role of the monarchy dice. During his reign, Ottoman territory will more than double. One thing he does that his father and grandfather did not do is attack other Turks. By this time, the memory of the Sultanate of Rum is indeed just a memory, and the Mongols are no longer as powerful as they had been a couple of generations before. This gives Murad an opportunity to conquer south into Anatolia. He starts by launching punitive raids against other Turkish beyliks. 
Some of the other bays were also getting a little bit restless and had started small-scale border raids against the Ottomans, and Murad was going to show them that that would not be tolerated, and then he would ultimately conquer as far south as the Mediterranean coast, at least for a small stretch along the Aegean. Now, with that being said, most of his conquests are going to be in Europe. Now, an exact timeline is hard to put together because outside of a few centers of learning, these Turks at this time, including Murad himself, are still illiterate. And meanwhile, the Byzantine sources are starting to become sparse because the capital is no longer in communication with many of the provinces. At this point, the emperor only actually controls a small area around Constantinople. But regardless of what he conquers when, what Murad ends up conquering is part of modern-day northern Greece and areas in Thrace just south of Serbia and Bulgaria. He is pressing awfully close to the part of Europe that is under papal influence. So far, the Ottomans have been tangling with the Byzantine Empire when they were tangling with Christians. Right? And the Byzantines are Eastern Orthodox, and at this time they don't have a lot of friends in the Christian world. All of a sudden, if you are starting to come close to Hungary, as the Ottomans are, all of those Catholic countries in the rest of Europe are going to get concerned. And that is what happens. And in the year 1363, the Pope calls for a crusade against the Ottomans. The crusade that follows is called the Savoyard Crusade because many of the leaders and the troops come from Savoy. That's a country that no longer exists, but it's roughly near modern-day Switzerland. Anyway, a collaboration between these Savoyard troops and leaders and a whole lot of Hungarians and even the Byzantine Empire is supposed to push the Ottomans out of Europe. That's their plan. Instead, they waste their time fighting the Bulgarians. Apparently, there is a lot of booty to be had in Bulgaria, and the Savoyard Crusade goes there first, and by the time they get all the way down to Gallipoli in 1366 to push the Ottomans out, it doesn't matter because the Ottomans already control a whole bunch of other land in former Byzantine territory in Europe. They still have a bridgehead, so functionally the Crusade is a failure that did nothing else but to make Bulgaria angry at all of its Christian neighbors. Sometime between 1365 and 1361, again, the timeline is not clear here, so maybe during the Savoyard Crusade, maybe just after it, but sometime in that six-year period... The Ottomans take the ancient city of Adrianople in Thrace. That is a major city, the second leading city of the Byzantine Empire, and that falls into their control, and Murad I gives it a new name. He calls it Adern, and he makes it his capital. And we do know the year that happens. That happens in 1376. At that point, the Ottoman Beylik is now officially a European power. During this time, 
a lot of the reason Murad is able to get away with all this is because the Serbians and the Bulgarians are trying to win their independence. We already mentioned that. And you have these two powers, right, the Serbs in sort of the northwest Balkans and the Bulgarians sort of in the northeast and then the Byzantines way down to the south of that and Murad now sort of in between in Thrace, well, he is able to play kingmaker or not or just keep playing both sides in an ongoing endless civil war and he eventually manages to secure the return of Gallipoli from the Byzantine Empire in exchange for helping one of their emperors. But that doesn't work out for the Byzantines. They don't get their hoped-for victory over the Serbians and the Bulgarians. No, instead, Murad defeats both of those powers and then forces both to swear fealty to the Ottoman Beylik. While Murad is still called a bey or an emir by his Turkish subjects, the Serbs and Bulgars give him another title, Tsar, which is simply their version of Caesar, Emperor. Now, Murad himself will never get to hear the Serbs call him by this name. He dies in 1389 in the Battle of Kosovo. But that battle will end up being the decisive one in his war against the Serbs, like the one where they are forced to swear vassalage to the Ottomans. Regardless, by the end of his reign, the Ottomans rule from the Balkans all the way down to central Anatolia. And the Byzantine Empire is now an empire in name only it has lost almost all of its territory. And subsequent emperors will be little more than puppets for the Ottomans or their rivals, the Venetians, or their rivals, the Genoese. All of them were competing for trade in the eastern Mediterranean, and all of them wanted a piece of the sweet, sweet Byzantine pie. Anyway, Murad's son, Bayezid I, would take the throne at the age of 29 in the year 1389. And the first thing he would do is secure peace with the Serbs. He would do this by accepting their oath of fealty, but also by marrying one of their princesses. Right? Bayezid would take as a wife a woman named Oliveira Despina, who is the daughter of the Serbian prince who Murad had been fighting against. And there are still periodic uprisings in the area now and then, but for the moment, this new bey, Bayezid, looks back east for conquest, back to Anatolia. Now, unlike earlier Ottoman leaders... Bayezid is educated and literate. So he is going to facilitate this invasion of Anatolia by using the law. Right? If he just goes to war against a bunch of Muslim neighbors, that's going to anger many of his Muslim subjects. And then there will be revolts and things like that. So before he goes to war, he employs the aid of a bunch of religious scholars. And he has all of these fatwas, which are Islamic legal rulings, printed out and put out all through the land. Uh, and all of these legal rulings are various justifications for him to invade these other Anatolian Turkic Beyliks. The other thing that Bayezid is able to do is he is able to leverage his new vassals, right? 
he doesn't just have Muslim troops. Now he has Christian, Byzantine, Serbian, and Bulgar vassals to do a lot of his fighting for him. So he can station a bunch of Turkish troops up in his Christian territories to keep the peace and keep anyone from thinking too seriously about revolts, and then he can have his vassals down in Anatolia fighting other Muslims, and since the vassals are Christian troops, he's not going to have as hard a time motivating them to fight. This is something earlier Ottoman leaders were not able to do because they didn't have a whole lot of Christian soldiers. Between 1389 and 1391, right over just the first two years of Bayezid I's rule, Ottoman armies would conquer from the Mediterranean coast of Anatolia all the way to the Taurus Antitaurus Mountains. That is a mountain range that roughly splits the Anatolian Peninsula in half, and There they stop for now. A lot of Bayezid's Muslim subjects are starting to get a little upset about all of this conquering in Anatolia, and for fear of provoking a revolt or anything like that, he decides that enough is enough for now. But just because he couldn't conquer any more Muslims for the time being did not mean that Bayezid was done conquering. In 1394, he would turn his attention to Constantinople, the jewel of the Mediterranean, and he would declare himself sultan e rum meaning Sultan of Rome, and he would lay siege to Constantinople. He would do so by land and by sea. There was a naval blockade. And this siege would last for eight years. It would last all the way until 1402. During that time... There would be another crusade launched by the Pope, and there would also be a separate French relief effort to save Constantinople. Both of those efforts would fail. Bayezid would fight both of them off while simultaneously maintaining the siege. But ultimately, in 1402, Byzantium would earn a reprieve not from the West, but from the East. This reprieve would come in the form of Tamerlane. If you listened to the episodes on the Delhi Sultanate, we talked a little bit about Tamerlane. He was a Mongol Turkic warlord who forged an empire in roughly modern-day Turkmenistan, Central Asia, centered around Samarkand, but it became a very large empire, and it stretched so far to the west that Tamerlane would start bumping up against the Ottomans and start attacking Bayezid's territory. And so in 1402, Bayezid is forced to abandon the siege of Constantinople to go fight off Tamerlane. In July of that year, Bayezid will meet Tamerlane in battle near the city of Ankara. Bayezid will lose, and he will become captured. And he will not live much longer. He will die in just a few months, the following March in 1403, in captivity from unknown causes. There are a number of conspiracy theories around this death. Depending on who you listened to, some people say Tamerlane forced his wife into menial labor and forced him to watch and then tortured him and locked him in a cage. There's one story where Bayezid actually commits suicide by 
beating his head against the bars of his cell rather than face any more humiliation. On the other hand, other stories say that not only did Bayezid die naturally, but that the great warlord Tamerlane actually wept at his funeral. Tough to say exactly what went on there. But regardless of how exactly he met his end, Bayezid's death would leave four claimants to the Ottoman throne. These are his sons, Suleiman, Isa, Mehmed, and Musa. Tamerlane himself appoints Mehmed as the new sultan. He actually leaves the Ottoman sultanate in place and wants Mehmed to be his vassal, but the other brothers all press their own claims, and this leads to a four-way civil war called the Ottoman Interregnum. At the outset of the war, Bayezid's oldest son, Suleiman, is in control of Thrace, northern Greece, and his Balkan territories, like pretty much everything in Europe. Suleiman also has the loyalty of Serbia and Bulgaria. Meanwhile, Isa controls western Anatolia, and Mehmed, the choice of Tamerlane, well, he controls central Anatolia. We'll get to Musa in a little bit. He's not quite around yet. But Medmed has to start by going to war against Isa. Suleiman might control all of these European territories, he might control the Christian vassals, but Isa is in between. And so, while Suleiman bides his time in Europe, Mehmed goes to war against Isa and ultimately defeats his army in battle, and Issa flees to southern Anatolia, where Mehmed's agents ultimately track him down and strangle him to death in his bathtub. Mehmed then calls on Tamerlane for help, right? Remember, Tamerlane had chosen him for the throne, so Mehmed asks for his brother Musa, the fourth brother, to be released from prison. Now, Musa had been taken captive in the same battle where Tamerlane captured Bayezid. But by now, Tamerlane wants his boy Mehmed to win this Ottoman civil war, the Interregnum, so he does as Mehmed asks, and Mehmed makes Musa his top general. Meanwhile, while this back and forth is going on, Suleiman invades Anatolia. He is not going to wait for Mehmed to consolidate his rule over all of the land in the west of Anatolia that he had taken from Issa. Suleiman's going to get in there from Europe and start taking land right away and causing trouble. And indeed, he advances as far as Ankara pretty quickly. But a desperate Mehmed decides to try a gambit. What he does is he takes Musa, right, his recently released brother, who is his top general, and he sends him to Europe. He sends him all the way around Suleiman's army, all the way to Thrace, to make war on Suleiman's Christian allies. And this works, Suleiman has no choice but to withdraw his armies back out of Anatolia into into Europe, to Thrace. Now, Musa loses to him in battle when they initially make contact, but by this point, Suleiman's Christian allies are tired of war, and they defect to Musa in the year 1411. And at that point, Suleiman does not have any help whatsoever. He and his last remaining Turks try a desperate battle against Musa. 
he loses and he is then executed at Musa's command. At this point, we now have Musa, the general in charge of Ottoman Europe, and Mehmed, the nominal sultan in charge of Ottoman Anatolia. But although the Serbs and the Bulgarians had ended up on Musa's side, right, they had betrayed Suleiman, the Byzantine emperor Manuel II never had. Musa wants to make an example of him for having been on the wrong side. So he besieges Constantinople. And of all people, the Byzantine emperor Manuel, he appeals to Mehmed for help. And Mehmed agrees to help the Byzantines. So now Mehmed is at war against his own general slash brother, Musa, and Musa's Turks are besieging Constantinople from the outside while it is being defended from within by Mehmed's Turks. Ultimately, the Christian allies once again will prove to be the decisive factor because in 1413, once again, they get tired of war, they're tired of this siege, and they defect to join Mehmed, and Musa is defeated in battle where he dies. So ends the Ottoman Interregnum. And while the Interregnum would last for 11 years, Mehmed I himself would only reign for eight and that time, from 1413 to 1421, was a time of reunification. Mehmed would have to put down more than one revolt, and he would also have to deal with religious unrest in the Balkans. There was a syncretic religious movement at the time. There was this wandering preacher who preached a combination of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, and it started gaining a lot of popular support, which made his other subjects who were not part of the movement nervous, and he ended up having to go put down this religious movement. And the most major problem he would face would be a revolt from a fifth brother, a man named Mustafa, who would be released from Mongol custody in 1415. At that time, Mustafa would ask to take half of the empire. He would get the support of a handful of Turkish leaders, as well as Emperor Manuel II of Constantinople again. And Mehmed says no. And Mehmed easily defeats him and exiles Mustafa into Byzantine custody. He makes Emperor Manuel II responsible for holding Mustafa in prison. Now, Mehmed would die in 1421, leaving the throne to his son Murad II, who takes over at the age of 16. But Manuel II, again, this Byzantine emperor, he refuses to recognize Murad II, as do several of the leading Ottoman Turkish lords. And Manuel releases Mustafa from prison. This brother of Mehmed's who had revolted and been put in Byzantine custody, well, Manuel lets Mustafa out. And Murad, this new 16-year-old sultan, he has to act quickly. And he defeats his uncle Mustafa in Gallipoli and executes him. And at that point, he turns his attention to Constantinople. He's going to take revenge on Manuel II for stirring up so much trouble and he would put Constantinople under siege for about a year, 
until Manuel re-swears allegiance to the Ottomans and agrees to doubling the amount of gold he pays in annual tribute. With his disloyal vassal firmly put down, Murad then sets about securing the Balkans once and for all. And he does this using an ancient tradition, I shouldn't say ancient, but you know, hundreds of years old tradition at this time, uh, called the Ghazi tradition. A Ghazi is an Islamic warrior king who makes holy war, but not just against non-Muslims, but against unjust rulers in general. This gives Murad justifications to attack Muslim neighbors. Much like his grandfather Bayezid, Murad is going to use Islamic law and tradition to help him build his empire. Now, a side effect of this propaganda, right, that he is fighting against unjust rulers, is that Murad has to go out of his way to exemplify justice as an ideal, and he generally does. For one example, when he conquers a city, when Murad's armies conquer an enemy city, there is to be no rape and only minimal looting. Compared to the wholesale chaos you often see in warfare in this period, he is trying to exemplify justice. Yes, I conquered these people, but I did it for their own good because their leader was corrupt. And as proof of that, I didn't even loot their city. And Murad leads a Spartan lifestyle. He spends most of his life in the field with his army, and except for a few special occasions, he dresses as a soldier would in the field, not as some sumptuous Ottoman sultan that you might picture. And he makes war to his east and his west. He doesn't just focus on the Balkans. He does a lot there, but he actually starts out by going to the east. There in Anatolia, there is another Turkic sultanate called the Karamanid Sultanate in the southeast, and Murad pushes them a little further southeast. He just sort of extends Ottoman territory a little further in that direction, and to the west, he pushes the Venetians out of the Balkans entirely. Right? They had controlled a lot of land, in what is modern-day Croatia, and they had been competing with Ottoman trade interests, and by the 1440s, the only power in the Balkans not in Ottoman hands or paying tribute is Serbia. They had managed to break through during the interregnum, and they have been kept safe by their ally, Hungary, which is a significant European power. And this has led to a tense standoff. But in 1443, Serbia, Hungary, and Murad, they all sign an agreement for a three-way 10-year truce. The Ottomans aren't going to attack Serbia or Hungary, and Serbia and Hungary are not going to attack the Ottomans. In 1444, a year later, Murad seems to be content with his conquests, and he also seems to be content that his northern border is secure, and he does not face any immediate threat. And so, he does something unexpected. At the age of only 39, he retires to southwestern Anatolia to spend his later years studying religion and philosophy, at least that's what he hopes, and he leaves the Ottoman Sultanate in command of his 12-year-old son, the very young Mehmed II. 
this retirement and appointment of a new sultan does not have the effect that Murad had intended. It makes the Hungarians really, really nervous. Their leader is the 20-year-old king, Vladislaw III of Poland. He is the king of both countries, and he fears that with such a new sultan and such a young one at that, uh, that this new sultan, Mehmed II, is going to try and make his mark by breaking the truce and attacking Serbia. And to preempt that, he calls to the Pope to help launch a new crusade. And the Pope agrees. As it turns out, the Hungarians are about to break the peace treaty. And when Mehmed II gets word of this, he decides that he is not competent to lead his armies. I mean, who can blame him? He's 12 years old. So he sends a message to his father telling him to come back and please lead the armies, and Murad refuses. He says that Mehmed is the sultan now and must defend his own people. Mehmed then sends a second message to his father, and it says, quote, If you are the sultan, come and lead your armies. If I am the sultan... I hereby order you to come and lead my armies. Unquote. And at this, Murad agrees to return, but not as sultan, as a general. And while he is gathering his army together down in Anatolia, the first crusader blow strikes, and this blow is led by the papal fleet with their Burgundian allies. This is a naval attack, and what they do is they attempt to blockade the Dardanelles and the Bosporus. Those are the two narrow straits where you can easily get from Europe to Asia and vice versa. They attempt to blockade those straits to keep Murad and the bulk of the Ottoman army stuck in Anatolia. Right? And that would allow Crusader ground forces to liberate Bulgaria from Ottoman control and then maybe press south. Well, unfortunately for the Crusaders, the naval blockade fails and the Ottoman army under Murad makes it across into Europe. And at this point, both forces, the Ottoman force under Murad and the Crusader ground force, make a beeline for the Crusader's target. And that target is the city of Varna. This is a port on the Black Sea coast in Bulgaria. And the Crusaders hope that if they can drive the Turks out of Varna, it will lead to a broader Bulgarian uprising. And indeed, by the time their army gets there, it has been joined by a handful of Bulgarian rebels. So this strategy does seem sound, but when the Crusaders win the race, when they get to Varna first, they find themselves trapped. The Ottoman army catches up to them a couple days later on November 9th, and the Crusaders find themselves pinned between the Ottoman army to their west and the Black Sea and the city of Varna to the east. And then to the south, there is a marsh, and there is a Lake Varna to the southwest, and then to the north, there are some ridges and really jagged terrain. So the only way out is right through this Ottoman army. This Ottoman army Murad has brought to bear consists of approximately 45,000 men. 
it's not quite clear what the exact composition is. Seems like roughly half of them are light cavalry or lancers, and the other half are heavy Janissary infantry. These are Christian boys who were captured at a young age and pushed into service, and their descendants will also be Janissaries. So a lot of these people are second or third generation by this point. Those Janissaries dig in on the center of the Ottoman line. The Crusader army is outnumbered a little more than two to one. It is a 20,000-man multinational force. It includes bombard cannons, right? The Crusaders do have some artillery, although it's not terribly mobile or reliable. They do have some. And they also have uh, roughly 7,000 light cavalry to help out, uh, commanded by a gentleman named Mercia II of Wallachia. Might know some of his relatives a little better. His father's name is Vlad Dracul, and his brother would become known as Vlad the Impaler. And that night, the Crusaders meet in a leadership council. Some, including the papal representative, advise surrender. Others want to try and maybe break out and escape during the night and go regroup somewhere else. But the overall military commander, a Hungarian nobleman named Jan Hunyadi, uh, he wants to fight. And Vladislaw III, that king of Poland and Hungary, well, he agrees. So the next morning, the morning of November 10th, 1444, the Crusaders awaken to see the Ottomans lined up ready to fight. As I said, the Janissaries are dug in in the center, and the Ottoman cavalry is out to the flanks. The Janissaries, they're really entrenched in a defensive position. It looks like most of the offensive is going to come from the Turkish cavalry, and indeed it will. The Crusaders deploy their forces with the infantry in front, and they keep their mounted cavalry in reserve to respond to whatever the Ottomans end up doing. The Ottomans strike first, They attack the Crusader flanks, and both sides respond with fire from their bombard cannons and their crossbows, and the Ottomans retreat. The Crusader infantry on the left stays put, but the infantry on the right pursues the retreating Ottoman cavalry and leaves the rest of their formation behind. As it turns out, there are other Ottoman cavalry lying in wait, and as soon as those crusader forces have advanced too far away from their supporting formations, those cavalry hit them in the side. And this forces them to turn and run, and most of them are killed. And Some of those who survive are even pursued all the way around the battlefield back to the marshes in the south, all the way past the other side of the Crusader line. Seeing this happen, Murad orders the Ottoman cavalry to make another attack on the Crusader left. And at this point, Jan Hunyadi, the Hungarian nobleman who's the military leader on the scene for the Crusaders, he leads half of the cavalry in a counterattack against this latest Ottoman charge, and he tells Vladislaw to stay put with the other half of the cavalry in reserve. But instead, Vladislaw seems to want a little bit of glory for himself. 
And so while Jan Hunyadi is off beating back the Ottoman cavalry on the left, Vladislaw launches a direct frontal assault against the Janissaries in the Ottoman center. What he's hoping to do is break through to Murad's camp. And for a minute, it looks like it's going to work. His men kill many Janissaries. They push in places across the Janissary Trench, and they nearly get through. But eventually, the young king's horse goes down. It's not clear whether it was stabbed or stepped on something, but... His horse goes down, and Vladislaw III is beheaded in the field by a Turkish soldier. And at the sight of the king's head being held up in the air, the rest of the crusader cavalry turn and run, and Hunyadi is only able to salvage a few thousand men for an orderly retreat. Meanwhile, Murad hardly has to ever leave his command tent or break a sweat. Murad II would ultimately take over as sultan again, a couple years later in 1446, and he would rule for another five years. He would face Jan Hunyadi again at the Battle of Kosovo in 1448 and defeat him a second time. But... For most historians, the Battle of Kosovo is somewhat of a footnote to the Battle of Varna. Varna was the battle that left the Ottomans as undisputed rulers not just of Anatolia, but of Greece and the Balkans. For the next three and a half centuries, the peoples of Serbia and Bulgaria and the other Balkan nations would live as subjects under the Ottoman Empire. But one part of Osman's dream remained unfulfilled. The crown jewel of cities, Constantinople, at this time is still independent. The conquest of that city would be left to Murad II's son, Mehmed II, the one who called him back into service, well, that same Mehmed II would eventually be known in his own right as Mehmed the Conqueror. But that conquest would not have been possible if it weren't for a number of causes. The Mongol invasions created a power vacuum in the Muslim world, and the plague worsened that vacuum while weakening the Byzantines at a crucial time. The Ottomans would take advantage of that historical opportunity, and they would do it with a little bit of luck in a series of highly skilled emperors. And at the end of this period, they would create an empire that would span three continents. And that's why it's relevant. Hello again, it's Dan, and I'm here to let you know about a few things we are doing to grow the show here at Relevant History. First off, there is now a monthly video series called Dan's War College. In that series, I, myself, do a video presentation on a particular battle from history and break down the tactics and the strategy involved. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, that is available at the Relevant History Patreon page, and that video, along with access to a private Discord server and, of course, a shout-out on the show, well, that can all be had for the low, low price of $5 a month. But if that's not enough, I'm also doing a monthly audio series called Irrelevant History, where we discuss silly or quirky events from history, 
that show, along with a couple of other shows from other people, well, those are all available on the Salad Tossers Patreon channel, and that is only $1 a month. And just like the Relevant History Patreon channel, you can find the link for that in the description. And of course, if you'd like to hear more episodes, they're available on every major podcast service, most of the minor ones, and at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Don't forget to share the show with your friends and leave reviews on your favorite service. Every little bit helps, and if you'd like to get in touch, you can find the show on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast, that's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, Podcast, or on Facebook at Dan Toller, T-O-L-E-R. Finally, you can email me directly at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, Podcast at gmail.com. Hope to hear from you soon.